Uh, now today, uh, uh, the last two sermons, I've, I've been enjoying preaching this adulting series. Y'all been enjoying? I've been enjoying this series. And, and it, was, it was more preachy and motivational the last couple of weeks. Um, today we're going to do more talking. Um, it's, it's, we're not going to be real preachy today. Um, we're going to do a whole lot of talking today um, because we have a lot to talk about. Um, amen. Is that all right? Can, can we just talk a little bit today? Um, because we have a whole lot to talk about today. Um, if you can, please stand for the reading of the scripture. Um, we're in 1 Corinthians 7, 29 through 35. The Bible reads, What I mean, brothers, is that the time is short. From now on, those who have wives should live as if they had none. Those who mourn as if they did not, those who are happy as if they were not, those who buy something as if it were not theirs to keep, those who use the things of the world as if not engrossed in them, for this world in its present form is passing away. Uh, touch your neighbor and tell them the time is short. I would like you to be free from concern. An unmarried man is concerned about the Lord's affairs. How? He can please the Lord. But a married man is concerned about the affairs of this world, how he can please his wife. And his interests are divided. An unmarried woman or virgin is concerned about the Lord's affairs. Her aim is to be devoted to the Lord in both body and spirit. But a married woman is concerned about the affairs of this world, how she can please her husband. I am saying this for your own good, not to restrict you, but that you may live in a right way in undivided devotion to the Lord. Uh, we're in a series called Adulting, and, and we're, today we're going to be talking about dating. And so I want you to, if you can, I want you to just touch your neighbor, shake your neighbor's hand and say, neighbor, Keep God as your priority. Amen, amen, amen. You may be seated. We're going to look at... We're going to look at some Christian pickup lines. I'm trying to help somebody to game today. So, so is, this, is this one working, sisters? No. Oh, all right, okay, that, that one ain't working. All right, uh, let's. <laughs> no, oh, all right, all right. This, I'm telling you, this one, this one, next one's the one. Oh, they grinning though. Oh, they grinning though. Uh-huh. Okay, brother, this is a win here, brother. You must have been born water. Amen. Because the Lord turned you into fine. Yeah, 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 yeah. That one's working. All right. How about this one? <laughs> Amen. We're going to be talking about, about dating today. We gave the, the, the definition of adulting on last time. We, we said adulting, the act of engaging in responsible actions and tasks, in a mature manner that makes one feel like an actual grown person without throwing a tantrum. Here's a definition of, of dating. And I know it's, it's a true definition because I got it off the internet. <laughs> so it says, dating is where two people who are attracted to each other spend time together to see if they also can stand to be around each other most of the time. If this is successful, they develop a relationship. Although sometimes a relationship develops anyways, if the people uh, can't find anybody else to date them or are very lonely or one person is only attracted to the other and pretends to be in love with the second unfortunate person who has the misunderstanding that they have found love. This occurs quite often and eventually leads to something called cheating. So there's a definition of, <laughs> of dating. Amen. Amen. I'm... Uh, 
me give you a little history about dating. And I won't be as, uh, I'll try not to be as long as I was this morning. Um, because in order to understand dating, you need to understand where it came from. Uh, dating is, 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 is less than 100 years old, the idea of dating. Before dating, there was a thing called courting. And dating, dating is actually an addendum to courting. People still court, but now we have added dating to it. Now, the reason uh, uh, dating was, uh, no, okay, now before courting, uh, what you had was get married. That's what you had. You, you'd walk in, down a field. Amen. See a woman, amen, and you'd see if she was single, amen, and you'd ask her daddy. And her daddy would say, send your daddy. Just say it's Bob down the street, and Bob sees Rick's, uh, uh, Rick's son comes to Bob and says, you know, uh, uh, Bob, I'd like to, to marry your daughter, uh, Penelope, and, uh, and, and so, so Bob says, go get your daddy, Rick. And so Rick comes and starts talking to Bob about his son, Buford, uh, uh, <laughs> marrying Penelope. And, and are y'all with me still? And so what, what happens is uh, uh, Bob says, tells Rick, I'll tell you what, uh, you want your son to marry uh, 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 Penelope, well, tell Buford uh, the next time he sees me, he needs to bring 20 goats. Uh huh. Now, if, if, if the dowry price is right, um, Buford would bring the 20 goats and they would be what's called betrothed. We call it engagement. They'd be betrothed. Now, betrothal was legal and binding, but it wasn't marriage. It was marriage without sex. Because she still belonged to her daddy until you could prove you could take care of her. <laughs> yes, sir. And so what, what, what Buford would have to do is go back and, and build a house or, or get some kind of house attached to Rick's house, right? Or, or, or get some land, and usually it was land next to Rick's land because folk were poor. Are y'all following this yet? And so once he did that and once he could prove he could feed her and protect her, he would go back and then they would have marriage. Now, the marriage could last anywhere from one week to two or three months the celebration of the marriage. But this idea of dating was just nothing. Fast forward now, back to more modern times. We're going to skip over a whole lot of pertinent information uh, because we just ain't got time. And so now we're up uh, before, uh, we're right during the Industrial Revolution uh, approaching into World War II. Now the reason the Industrial Revolution is so important is because it changed how society interacted with one another. And so now, instead of everything being clan and family, everything is now uh, individualized. People start getting cars, et cetera, et cetera. And then you had World War II, where 750,000 men died. So the first time in America, now women significantly outnumber men. So now we need a way to pick. And so people would start this thing called courtship. Now, courtship wasn't like, courtship was a private activity done in public. And so if, if, uh, uh, if, if, if Michelangelo wanted to uh, a court Loquisha, <laughs> Michelangelo would come sit in the parlor if Loquisha's daddy said it was all right. Now, but mind you, he's not sitting in a parlor with Loquisha by himself. No, no, no. <laughs> yeah, they didn't need condoms. Because it wasn't nothing happening. So that was courtship. It kind of morphed into dating. I'm skipping a whole lot of stuff. I just ain't got time for all of it. It kind of morphed into this thing we call dating. Interesting fact. Dating, most sociologists believed did not start in uh, 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 righteous relationship terms. Dating started in the world of prostitution. When a man wanted to meet a prostitute, 
he would give her or she would give him a date. <laughs> yes, some things just don't start wrong and they just keep getting wronger and wronger. But anyway, so, and, but this was only low class folk at first. But then all of a sudden, you know, rich folk are like, oh, that's a pretty good idea. And so <laughs> they started dating also, but also, now it's all of a sudden it started becoming a socially acceptable idea. And everybody's now dating, but it's not with prostitutes, it's with uh, regular old folks. Now, in the beginning, dating was not like we, like we see dating today. Uh, dating was more a social construct, uh, uh, more so than only a mate-finding construct, meaning uh, dating um, after the World War II um, was about status. So if, 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 if you could have more guys courting you, your social status went up. And if you could see more social status, so what would happen is uh, one guy would see several girls. And one lady would have several guys come calling. Now, they wasn't going nowhere. <laughs> but they would all come calling. Are y'all following this? So it was social status. But then it morphed into something else. And uh, I'm going to end my first part of my, my lesson there. I, I got a couple of special things to do for you. I got two three-minute presentations. Um, one is from a single young man. <laughs> I can't wait for this. <laughs> Why don't y'all put y'all hands together, Brother Cameron Morris. Good morning. Good morning. Um, yeah, so I'm not going to be doing any preaching or any sermon today. I'm literally just um, answering a few questions that um, Faith gave me about the struggles um, of dating. Um, I'm going to just bring the millennial perspective. I think that's really the value I would add here. Um, but if we look at Corinthians 6, 18, it talks about fleeing from sexual immorality. Um, it says, all other sins a person commits are outside the body, but whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. Um, and this really pertains both to premarital relations as well as extramarital relations. But in accordance with our theme of dating for this week, I really only consider the former this morning, um, as I hope the married folks aren't still out there, you know, dating. And if you are, just, you know, just look straight ahead and don't blink. But um, it's, key, it's key to note that at the time the scripture was written, as fate kind of alluded to, the average, I mean, the age of consent for marriage is like 12 or 14 years old. Um, and then... In these days, we're kind of approaching the average age of marriage being closer to like 30 and beyond. Um, so I think it's safe to say that back then there was a, a shorter interval of time between puberty and marriage. And if we think about it, if you've heard of Faith talk about this before, puberty kind of represents um, the time biologically when we're ready to have sex. And uh, marriage is kind of more of the time, I would say, maybe sociologically or spiritually when we're ready to have sex. And um, the, the thing is, as that interval gets wider, it gets harder and harder to be able to consistently flee from sexual immorality, at least in my own uh, experience. So I guess the, it begs the question of, you know, why? What's causing this interval to continue to expand? Because um, if it was just like, if you're getting, hitting puberty at 15 and you're not going to get married at 16, I think it will be a lot easier for many of us um, who are, you know, um, single to to be able to continuously flee from sexual morality because that for me that's one of the biggest struggles with dating um, as a Christian is is um, being able to remain pure um, almost like a prison bid like if, if you're doing one to three years you can, you can kind of keep it keep your act together you know and you don't want to get no time at it but if we're doing 25 to life you know you know your, your, your behavior is gonna be a little bit different I don't want to compare <laughs> celibacy to prison or anything like that but it, it's almost uh, you know similar in that way. But um, what I really want to key in on is from the millennial perspective, millennials, you can let me know if this is true. I, I think one of the factors, besides the ones he's already mentioned, this industrial revolution, the wars, one thing that's caused um, people to kind of push back on when they're finally getting married, I think, is, I think social media has had a, a really big impact on it. Um, and I think it's because it's created this kind of a catalog culture where you can go on your phone and you're flipping through your timeline or your explore page, and you're constantly bombarded with these images of, of, of women 
from all around the world who are, you know, attractive women, beautiful women, and, and you're, you're, it caused you to constantly compare the people that you're dating to these kind of unrealistic um, images of, of women. Like, I think back to, like, my great-grandfather who came from Alabama. Um, when he was of age to start to think about marriage and dating, I mean, he probably was in a town of, I, mean, I don't know how many people, but probably had a graduating class of 20. Of those 20, probably 10 were women. Of those 10, probably three were very attractive. So if you're able to get one, well, no, not in that way, but of those three, if you're able to get one of those three, you pretty much like, okay, well, you know, you're, you're good to go. You kind of lock that in and you, you don't really look back, you know, because you don't have much to compare it to. But um, in these days, you know, you're kind of having women and men are kind of having to be compared to thousands and millions of other people because, you know, we're constantly attached to these, these phones with Instagram. We're seeing all these images of people that are probably already photoshopped anyway and face tuned and this, that, and the third. But it, it, it causes um, these instances where, I know me personally, I've been in multiple relationships where great girl, beautiful, intelligent, all those things, but I would self-sabotage because I want to be available just in case something better came along because I'm always bombarded. No, this it's true. I'm sure people out here can, can attest to that as well. Um, so I don't really have the, the answers or the solutions to this. I, my job was just to kind of present, you know, some of the struggles, but I think social media is definitely one of those struggles. Come on, did he do a good job? Yes, sir. Amen. Amen. I got one more uh, quick presentation. Um, I just wanted y'all to kind of, like, this is going to be a little different today. I, I wanted to have a couple come up to kind of talk about um, how to set boundaries and, and what they're doing right now to, to kind of set boundaries as, as a young couple. So I'm, I'm looking for Quentin and Destiny. Uh, Quentin and Destiny. Quentin was sick this morning. I put him in my office. He was sick this morning. Is he, is he all right? Is he still sick? So I guess it's destiny. <laughs> Your destiny hand, amen. Yeah, he was, he was super sick and he was laid out and I said, man, just go in my office and just lay down. So I guess he's probably still sick. So we are just going to kind of have like this back and forth rant that we trying to do. Some of you guys know it, but um, it was funny. Okay, so <laughs> basically, Dad came to me yesterday and he was like, "Well, I want you guys to talk about boundaries in your relationship, like based off of like a young Christian couple." And Quentin and myself, we're really weird as far as like how we first met to now and to where we want to end up. And he claimed that he was a part of a whole plan about not touching, not hugging, not holding anything, but that was me. I was the first one to say it, even when we were talking. Even when we were talking, <laughs> I was always like, no. Like, it took me forever just to hold that fool's hand. Like, I would not touch him, and I was like, nah, you can't at all until, so. Um, yeah, and then just some of the key points that we talked about as far as like keeping boundaries in like a Christian relationship, especially when you're not married and today, like Cameron had great points about social media. Like there's always competitions out there with social media, especially like with our young women in the church, they always feel like they have to look and act like certain women that they see on TV all the time and the shows that I put on don't help. Um, so basically, um, <laughs> well, in my defense, I do a lot of game shows, so it's different. <laughs> We don't play games, like, for money. <laughs> I don't do them other ones. But, um, yeah, so far as boundaries, like, with Quentin and myself, we, we pre-set our boundaries during, like, the dating phase. Like I said, no, like, holding hands, no hugging. Like, we, like, would sit across from each other. There would be, like, no physical contact because we didn't want to have that, um, what do you call it? We didn't want to have that pressure in the relationship so early on because then that can lead to other problems. Like when you start to get intimate so fast, so quickly, you forget all the other things. Like I, I feel like that's kind of like a cloud when you start dating. It's like, oh, if we're already sexually active, then it's like, where else can we go from there? Because that should be like your end result. Um, a lot of times 
like you know, people say we kind of swerve situations that may cause stumbling blocks in our relationship. So a lot of the times, like we would always hang out like at my parents' house. Like we were always there all the time, like in the living room. We wouldn't go anywhere else. And of course, my dad can attest to this. He always made him leave at a certain hour. Like he, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I thank him now, but before I was just like, dude, like if we wanted to do something, we would have done it already. But, but, yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, that was my that was my mindset, but it did it did help me a lot. Like coming out of college and then talking to like the wrong guys, and then when I finally met Quentin, it was like, oh, okay, so I want to start over and do it right. That's why I was like boundaries from the beginning. Like I didn't want to do anything at any time until you know we got to our end goal. Um, it also helps when your partner can make light of the situation. Like Quentin, a lot of times you can't tell when he's serious because he always has like this resting face all the time. <laughs> like when it's funny, he won't laugh. He'll stare, but it's funny to him later, but he won't show emotion. So he likes to make light of situations. Like if we're starting to get too close or whatever, he'll like bust a joke or he'll, I wouldn't say hit me, that's bad, but he'll just do something to kind of keep us in like a straight path, in a straight way. Um, we always go out a lot, like we don't hang out in the house a lot. We do our best to stay out of the house. Like we'll go like to the movies or we'll go get something to eat or um, we'll go get massages or something like that. But you know, it's just, it's just something to keep a, a good distraction. Um, also in a relationship, we constantly learn about each other so that we can learn to deal with what may come about later on. So like the more you learn about your partner and who you wanna be with, the more you can know on how to handle certain situations when it comes up and you guys can help each other out in this situation if you kind of feel like the tension is gonna be there. Also, you need to have a lot of Christian friends that you can talk to. And especially if you're in a relationship, you wanna have Christian friends that are in a relationship. You don't wanna talk to Christian friends who are single because they're coming from a single mindset. You know what I'm saying? You want to have someone who's been, even if you're not married, have a Christian relationship with someone who is married, some, somewhere where you want to be. Like, if you have, like, this dream couple, go to that dream couple. Don't tell them you're my dream couple. Just go up to them and tell them, like, hey, <laughs> can I ask you for some advice? Because I want to know how you made it 20, 30 years of marriage. You know what I'm saying? And I want to bring up a couple of scriptures. Um, Hebrews 13. Where is my thing? Let me see. That was one of those <laughs> Hebrews 13 and 4, it says marriage, marriage should be honored by all and the marriage bed kept pure for God will judge the adulterer and all the sexually immoral. Keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have because God has said, you know, X, Y, Z. But it was really the first part, marriage should be honored by all and it should be. And I'm kind of happy with today's society, people are still getting married. So that is a big upset upside to what's going on now people are still wanting to get married i mean i don't know if it's for the right reasons or the wrong reasons but it's still an example that some of our kids can look at today um and one more scripture First Thessalonians 4, 3 through 5, it is God's will that you should be sanctified, that you should avoid sexual immorality, that each of you should learn to control your own body in a way that is holy and honorable, not in passionate lust like the pagans who do not know God. Y'all say amen. That's my baby. That's right. That's right. And y'all pray for Quentin. He really wasn't feeling with feeling well on, on this morning. Amen? Amen. 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 So let's kind of just jump in here. Um, first, we want to talk about the purpose of dating. And we're not going to stay long on the purpose. Um, just understand that, that, that the purpose of dating um, um, has, to, has to fall in line with God's purpose for men and women. So the purpose of dating is in order to find someone to marry. That's the purpose of dating. If you have some different purpose for dating, uh, 
uh, it's going to be hard for you to line that up with what Scripture talks about in male-female relationships. Amen? Yes. Amen. I'm not going to stand up because i got like forever to go. So y'all still with me? Y'all writing on your, on your papers? The principles, practices, and problems in dating. Principle number one, dating has a purpose. Dating has a purpose. And I say that twice because we get a lot of purposeless kind of lifestyles. We date because it's just a thing to do. I'm lonely. I need a date. So we start dating. I'm other things, so I get a date. We just start dating. Yeah, I didn't want to say it. Come on now, see that? You know me a little bit too well. Amen. So, so, so dating has a purpose. And, and Yeah, amen. And if you keep it in that purpose, then these other things won't bother you as much. Next, dating is not a purpose. Dating is not a purpose. Your purpose in life is not to date. Amen. Amen. Dating is, is not a purpose. My purpose in life. No, your purpose in life is, had nothing to do with dating. Um, uh, dating is an event. Dating is not a purpose. Dating is something you do to, to have something else happen. Yeah. Amen. Because when you get caught up in what we call a dating relationship, which is kind of silly, um, but these dating relationships, all of a sudden things get kind of goofy. Amen. Amen. Recreational dating is dangerous. Recreational dating is dangerous. Dating just... To, to, <laughs> recreational dating is dangerous. Dating has parameters. You, <laughs> you ought to know what's what before you go on a date. You should have already decided <laughs> before you left on a date what the parameters of the date are. You should dress in accordance with the parameters of the date. You should go places on the date that fit the parameters of the date. Can I be real for a second? Oh. <laughs> I ain't never been a look but don't touch person. So so, so taking me to a place where I got to do all I'm looking and can't touch, it, it's, it's not going to be good. So if you set your parameters beforehand, you won't end up at the strip club. You won't look up like, I don't know how I got here. We're just talking, right? Amen. Dating has parameters. Dating has a point. You should be dating and say, well, the point of my dating this person is I see this person as possibly a person I could get married to one day. <laughs> dating is an event, not a relationship. We talked about that already. Dating is not a destination. It's transportation. Like a tram. Like you're on, the, on, the, on the airport, you get on the tram to go from one station to the next. That's what dating is. Dating is something to get you from point A to point B. Dating. How many of you ladies ever go to the beauty shop? Just three of y'all? Please everybody raise your hand because then you make me want to say something snarky. <laughs> like you need to go or, or why you don't go. <laughs> Have you ever been to the, okay, so, so, <laughs> so I'm just messing with you. So dating is like the waiting room. You have a plan. Singleness is the plan. And then you get there at the waiting room. You get in the waiting room before you go get your hair done. You don't go to sit in the waiting room just to be sitting in the waiting room. You have a purpose of being in the waiting room, right? So you're sitting in the waiting room. You're reading the little magazines. Everybody's coming in and out, right? You meet a whole lot of folk in the waiting room. But you don't go in the waiting room and decide to stay. You don't go in the waiting room and start fixing your own hair. You, <laughs> y'all gonna get this in a minute. You, you need to get to the, to the, in that right, to the salon, so that you can get your hair done. 
You don't want to be like five years in the waiting room. The waiting room is going to be like a short little time. You don't go in the waiting room. Because it's funny because, you know, for some reason, for some reason, all the women, I don't see this with guys much, maybe because we, but your beauticians, why can't they never be on time? Why can't they never be on time? I mean, if they say 6 o'clock, they mean like 8. I mean, it's not even like 6.15. It's like 8. But anyway, I digress. You don't go in the waiting room to stay forever, right? You go in the waiting room to wait to get what you're trying to get to. But for some reason, we get this dysfunctional situation where the waiting room becomes the end goal. And we're glad to just be in the waiting room. Girl, I got a date, girl. You're feeling great. Bruh, we've been dating like 10 years. Why is that bragging? Why is that? Why are you bragging about dating? Why is that bragging? You're stuck in the waiting room. All right. Dating is not harmless. 1 Corinthians 15, 13, 15, 30 through 34. Bad company corrupts good morals. When you date folks that are evil, it infects you. If you date the wrong folks, you get infected by wrong. And I know what you say. No, 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 no. I'm going to make them holy by... No, you're not. No, you're not. Dating is not a substitute for relationships. Dating is not your purpose. Dating is secondary to God's business. Here's what I want to get to. Dating has a progression. This is the principle. I, this guy, his name is Mike Todd. Y'all listen to him sometimes. Um, he's a good preacher. Um, he has some good stuff on, online. His name is Mike Todd. He says, here's the progression of relationships. You start with singleness. Then intentional dating. Then engagement. Then marriage. Then love. Then children. Let me say it again. Singleness. Intentional dating. Engagement. Marriage. Love. Children. I know what you're saying. You're saying, you're saying no, no, no. No, no, no. You find somebody you love. Haven't you ever heard the Bible? First come love, then come marriage, then come the baby <laughs> in the baby carriage. <laughs> well, quote a scripture that says that. Quote me one scripture that says marry who you love. Waiting. Google it. I can quote a scripture where it says, love your wife. I can quote one that says, love your husband. See, the fact that I must love them presupposes that they are there when I'm told to love them. You say, well, then, Brother Haggard, well, <laughs> well, let me ask you a question. Love in the Bible is a commandment. Right? That means it cannot be connected um, to dopamine spikes overwhelming lust or emotional encounters because you can't command any of those. But God commands love. Oh God, I'm going to mess. Somebody about to be mad at me, Brother Alvin. And I really don't even care. Don't care. You marry somebody who will help you get closer to God. You loving them comes later. God. Because they don't understand love. They think love got something to do with my decision and how I feel and what's going on with me. You know, I'm in my feelings. They're feeling like you know. You know, all of a sudden they, they feel they feel like, feel like oh yeah, they feel they all their feelings, you know. Well, I, I and then folk leave folk because I don't love them anymore. Because does not God want me to love? Doesn't God want me happy? Let me tell you something about God. God wants you holy. 
God wants you obedient. God wants you submitted. God wants you to have faith. The kind of faith that trusts him more than your doggone little, tiny little, trifling little feelings. We're just talking today. Hey, come on, last couple of weeks, we've been preaching up in this place. Come on now. We've been shouting and having a good time. We're going to talk today. Because when you talk about dating, you need to date somebody who can take you higher for God. Yeah. Because after you marry a person, God's command is love them. Remember, we, you say, why are we going off all that, all that, uh, that history stuff? Because I want you to have a, a context of the things I'm saying. Remember back in the day, in order to marry, for, for, Penel for Penelope to marry Buford, they daddies got together and made it happen. Your daddy didn't make yours happen. You decided. Matter of fact, it took some of y'all 30 years to decide. And after 30 years, all of a sudden, you choose somebody, and all of a sudden, because you mad or, or whatever reason, you decide you don't want them no more. You think God respects that foolishness? Oh, don't worry. Y'all going to be mad today. <laughs> oh, don't worry. You're going to be way upset, way mad. Because in the church, what we have done is some ungodly stuff. We have taught folks things that are sideways to Scripture. And then as a church, then we judge them for doing stuff that we should have taught them in the first place. We need to be ashamed of ourselves. And I'm talking about me as preachers. We teach this whole sideways stuff. Uh, we, we tell our, we tell our uh, I ain't got to that point yet, so I'm just stay right here. We teach that kind of ideology. And then when they get married, they don't know how to be married. And so they're miserable. And the reason they're miserable is because in their single life, they spent all their time thinking of how to please themselves. When in their single life, their entire being was supposed to be saturated in how to please the Lord. So now they get married, and suddenly, We want them to learn some stuff. It's hard now, baby. That's what I'm teaching you now. You can be mad at me today. That's all right. Be mad, get in a huff, do all of that. But I need you to know, though, is this will set you free. This will help you. Because you'll come to find out that the person you love ain't the person you marry. Because love make you crazy. Oh, come on now. Y'all don't understand. Love make you crazy. You be fine blind. <laughs> Love make you cray cray. You'll say things like, I know, but, but what? <laughs> if it was a car, you wouldn't say that? <laughs> if somebody tell you, you know what, this car broken down. <laughs> it's missing the brake broke. <laughs> <laughs> It backfired every day. But I like the color. I can change it. I can fix it. I don't mind paying full price. Because marriage is full price. You, you do not understand that. It is for single. Oh, you want me to preach to married folk? <laughs> oh, oh, I can flip it. <laughs> I am talking to singles because in order for you to make the right decision on whom you're going to date, you got to understand the purpose of what you are dating. And you got to understand the ramifications of your choices. And you got to understand that once you get all in your feelings, you can't make the right decisions. So you have to set your parameters first. Like Eric. Eric likes you. I'm marrying the best woman at this church. Let me find her. <laughs> and and I, I know he be joking, he said, but I married above my station. <laughs> I know what I'm doing up in here. I'm going to marry the best one I can get. You know what? I know it don't sound romantic. It, it was, actually was a romantic thing. But it don't sound that romantic. But it makes a lot more sense than the mess we do. Ooh, she fine. She going, I want her to have my babies. <laughs> Throw your hands in there. How that make sense? That's just stupid. And then we wonder why all of a sudden we, we look at our lives and things are crazy. I'm 
I'm telling you right now, with all the, God, all the love of God in my heart, once you're married, God expects love. And God don't give you an out clause. So when I'm thinking about this beautiful woman I need to marry, I need to really show up be thinking about that. Well, Amber loved me. <laughs> oh, you ain't got no choice. You're my daughter. <laughs> You're going to love me anyway. So, <laughs> amen. Practices. Don't ever date a man or woman who hates the presence of God. Don't, don't date them. If they don't love God, don't date them. I don't care how fine she is. And don't even go there with me. Remember the first relationship, Genesis 2 and 3? Where was Adam? The Garden of Eden, right? Now, the Garden of Eden was a place God made. It was called the spot of God. The spot of open doors. There's a lot of, but, but that's the place God put him. It was a perfect place. And when God put him there, what did God tell Adam? Take care of the garden, right? Tended. He gave him purpose. He was in the presence of God. He had purpose and presence, right? Are, y'all, are we still together? Purpose and presence. And what did God do? He brought, did he bring him, bring him a woman? A help me, right? A helper fitting for him. Somebody can complete him in doing what God wanted, right? Here's the problem. We go look for somebody that ain't in the presence of God. And we say, what I'm going to do is I'm going to get him and drag him in the presence. Come on, I'll fix you. You say, Brother Higgett, that ain't fair. I ain't here for fair today. I'm here to help those who are single find the right person. You say, well, what if I'm already married? Well, that's a whole different. Y'all want me to talk about marriage? <laughs> I can talk about marriage, but I ain't here for marriage because there's a whole lot of grace got to go into marriage. Amen. A whole lot of mercy got to go into marriage because marriage is a whole different thing. When we talk about dating, though, see, dating needs to be a whole lot more intellectual. You need to really think about what you're doing. You can't get all in your feelings. <laughs> you, you just can't. You need to really think about what you're doing. Because once you make the decision, once you make the decision, then comes love. Love the commandment, not love the feeling. Love the commandment. And if you're a man, the love God commands you is agape. Full and total surrender to meeting the need of the other person. Brethren, they ain't no, they, you got one job. You got one job. And for a woman... The love that's commanded, Philandros, your job is to be your husband's fan all the time. And both are unconditional. You're not his fan when, when you feel good about it. So when you're looking for this mate, you need to be thinking, ooh, <laughs> ooh God going to have me cheering for this dude. Ooh. Bruh, we just got to be friends. Because <laughs> I do love you and stuff. But, woo, man. Don't ever date a man, a woman, whose mindset is different than your mindset about God. The Bible calls that being unequally yoked. Are we still good? All right, let's get to the problems. Problem number one. All these you're going to read, you guys are going to really love these. Problem number one, the attractive necessity. You know, we got the song out now, I'm in love with your body. Oh, that's one of the best songs out. Ed Sheeran, that's an amazing song. Oh, yeah. See, all right. All right. First Corinthians 6. 12 through 18. Let's, let's go look at that right quick. When we talk about the attract, attractive this necessity, 1 Corinthians 6. Just turn your Bible over there right quick. 1 Corinthians 6, 12. 
The Bible says, all things are lawful for me, but all things are not helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. Food for the stomach and the stomach of foods, but God will destroy both it and them. Now the body is not for sexual immorality, but for the Lord. And the Lord for the body. And God both raised up the Lord and will raise up us up by his power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a harlot? Certainly not. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a prostitute or a harlot is one body with her? For the two, he says, shall be one flesh. But he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. Flee sexual immorality. Every sin that a man does is outside the body. But he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you? whom you have from God, and you are not your own, for you are bought with a price. Therefore, glorified in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. This idea that attractiveness necessity. You say, well, what are you talking about? Well, I need to marry somebody I'm attracted to. I can't marry somebody I'm not attracted to. That's necessary for a good marriage. Let me, give you some, let me give you some real stuff. My playing weight in high school was 185. <laughs> when I got married, I weighed 195. Before I started losing weight here recently, I weighed 392. Y'all feel me yet? Now, if my wife would have jumped on the attractiveness thing, <laughs> she'd have been like, oh, boy. You know, when I married you, dude, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You, you, you can wear that little shirt with off. <laughs> you know, but you do. You know. Uh, <laughs> I'll give you another story. When my, when my, when my wife had our first child, Dustin, uh, when I first met my wife, she, she weighed about 135, 140. Um, that was my fine weight. I know I'm trifling. Stop it. I'm trifling, okay? That was then. Some of y'all trifling too, looking at me like y'all ain't trifling. Y'all had weights too, amen. Y'all, amen. So that was my fine weight. She was about 145, 135, 140. Oh, we. Uh. <laughs> so she had her first child. She had her first child. And she suddenly ballooned to like 85 pounds. She went from a size six to like a size two or zero. People thought she was sick. She was all baby. I said balloon so y'all listen. <laughs> and if y'all that know me, if you looked at all my past girlfriends, I ain't never liked skinny women. Not to date. I like looking at them, but I didn't want to date skinny women. You say, well, you trifling. You trifling too. <laughs> but now the reason I didn't like 20 skinny women wasn't because, because I did thought they were beautiful. I thought I was going to break them. I was dumb, okay? I was dumb. I know, I know. I know now, but I thought I was going to break them. So if a woman was skinny, I was like, dude, man, you, man. So I didn't want to fool no little skinny woman. Anyway, anyway, so next thing I know, I'm married to this woman that's like a size two. Well, she probably was a size zero, but she bought size twos. Are y'all following this? Now, if you look at her, her dating history, none of her ex-boyfriends look like me. I wasn't her type. And if you looked at my past dating history, none of my past girlfriends looked like her. She wasn't my type. Are y'all following this stuff yet? Now, if all of a sudden, if God thought, well, you know, the kind of woman that you attract, that, that's what you're going to do. No, no. What God did is he brought me what I needed. Because he knew I was trying to be God's man. I, and I, I left, I literally, I literally, I just, when I was dating, um, what y'all would call dating, um, I literally never went on dates when I was younger, but what y'all would call dating, um, I literally left women because they were drawing me away from God. Because I, well, I left one because I know I couldn't stay with her and stay sexually pure. It wasn't going to happen. I couldn't do it. I was way, way too sexually attracted to her. Had to leave her. Because I was taught early. Remember now, my creator, in the days of thy youth, before the evil days come, 
be thou an example of the believer in life, in purity. I was taught that early. I knew if I wanted to be, be God's man, I had to take it seriously. What we've done in the church is we've laughed off fornication. We've laughed off immorality. We have it in every song we, every picture we, every show we, and we play like it ain't nothing. Then we wonder why is we can't keep our, our lives pure in dating. Y'all still mad? Good. Next one, the next problem, the idea of sexual compatibility. I was listening to a preacher the other day, and he says, let me tell you about sexual compatibility. Here's what you need for sexual compatibility, a male and a female. Oh, y'all gonna, oh, don't, oh, don't worry. I, I told you, I'm gonna hit them all. All y'all gonna be like, I don't care. Let me tell you what my mama told me. I hope she don't get embarrassed. But when I was young, I did have a type. <laughs> I just, you know, I like curvy girls. <laughs> I <did> do. <laughs> I remember my mama told me, Faye, listen, let me tell you something. What one woman can do, another woman can do. about that. Well, I hadn't, you know. Uh, uh, is this too real? Uh, okay, let me go back to being more godly. <laughs> I, I was just trying to talk to y'all a little bit today. All of a sudden, we want to be sexually compatible. Let me tell you two things about sexual compatibility. First of all, it makes conditional what is supposed to be unconditional. It makes conditional what's supposed to be unconditional. Let me show you something about a woman. A woman's body changes. Women go through all kinds of changes. Not just physiologically, hormonally. What would have been awesome sexually at the beginning of your marriage ain't even cool no more. And let them have some children. It's a whole, I'm telling you, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just being real with you. Now, all of a sudden, you're not sexually compatible. So do you leave? Second one of this, it normalizes sin as a test for righteous relationships. Well, okay. How will you know whether or not you're sexually compatible or not before you get married? How shalt thou know? Pray tell. How knowest thou that you're sexually compatible before you got married? Forsooth, <laughs> it seems to me that we're normalizing sin because even in the church, I'm you, it's ungodly. We need to be ashamed. And, and, and the church is going to stand before God one day and we're going to answer for this immorality that we've paraded as righteousness. Well, you know, um, and I've seen it in Christian seminars. Well, you know, you need to find somebody you're sexually compatible with. Well, how would I know? Miss Christian, Mr. Christian, how do I know who I, how, how do I know without fornicating? How do I know? Because I know fornication sin. Right off the top of my head, I can quote you 10 scriptures on the sinfulness of fornication. Pray tell, how am I supposed to know? Well, you know, well, and let me tell you here. Well, you know, uh, you're going to get married and you're not sexually compatible. And, and what? Let me tell you something about marriage for y'all that ain't married. Married folk know this. They just don't tell nobody this. In marriage, you got to ask a whole lot of questions. Because the stuff you thought you knew, you really don't know. I had a, I had a friend, I was a couple, I was several years ago, I was, I was counseling this couple. Beautiful girl. I mean, she's just drop dead gorgeous. He's a handsome, handsome guy. I was counseling him. And one of the problems, major problems they had in the relationship is he was mad that she didn't respond to him like his old girlfriend she used to. Because, you know, his old girlfriend, they was acting like, you know, porn stars. Oh, God! You know, you know, the whole nine. The whole nine. Right? And now he mad because he's married this woman and she's not doing all that. And so he mad now because she's not giving him what he needs. See how ungodly that is? 
See, all of a sudden, all of a sudden, his fornication is destroying his marriage. Because you can't sin without being infected. And the only way you can get rid of that, that infection is by full repentance. Not just by stopping the activity, but you got to have metanoia. You got to change your mind, which starts with a change of how you think, how you process, and how you feel about stuff. It's just like becoming a vegan. Reason I can't become a vegan because I'm not ready to repent of meat. No, for real, for real. Y'all don't understand. See, so I'm not ready to repent. I might be ready to stop eating meat because I need to lose some weight. But I'm. I don't care how many uh, 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 <laughs> veggie patties you give me. <laughs> it is not going to taste as good as a double-double with cheese. I'm just trying to let you know. See, because I'm not ready. See, I, I, and that's what happens. People get married and they never repent. What they do is they stop bad behavior, but they never change their mind. They're still wishing for that girl that was acting like a porn star. And they don't, absolutely, because let, well, let, let me tell you what I was thinking. I didn't tell them this. Here's what I was thinking. If you were actually all that. <laughs> so I didn't say that then, though. You know, anyway, where was I? So you got to change your mind. You have to change your mind. We're just talking. You have to change your mind and change how you feel about it. And you can't change how you feel about something until you change your perspective on it. You can't change your perspective until you change who you are. And who you are has to do with how you feel about yourself. So until you realize how bad, how sinful you are, and that you need to be fully under the submission and sovereignty of God, feel and enliven with the Holy Spirit because the spirit you got ain't good enough, it's going to be hard for you to repent. Because you're going to still think your opinion matters about something. And how you feel. But until you understand that my opinion are tainted with sin. It's tainted with sin. And so, so the way I think, if, if I'm not getting it from Scripture, the way I think is wrong. And so me trying to repent, I'm just changing stuff. But in my mind, my autopilot is still telling me, find you a girl that'll holler like that girl. Wow. And that's the reason this whole thing about we, we keep telling people, well, you need to be sexually compatible, sexually compatible. Yo. What we need to tell people is live pure until you get married. And if you're not living pure now, understand that what you've done, if you've, first of all, what you've done in, in fornication, y'all ready for this? What you've done is you've stolen from another man or a woman something that belonged only to them. Only to them. It's extortion on the highest level. You rent in and took away from them something. And for a woman, what you've done is you, you've desecrated her temple. Because the holiest part of a woman is, is the part that has a veil. And that veil is not supposed to be split asunder until she's married. Read the scripture. Have you ever noticed why, all, why, how, how, many, how many times when you start talking about sex, he then starts talking about worship? He starts talking about consecration? In, in the passage we're, we're talking about, um, for um, know you not that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit, which is in you, and you are not your own, but you're of God. Because this idea of the consecration of the body and the purity of the body and the holiness of the body, it's not just a notion with God. And when we fornicate, we steal from God and we steal from somebody's future, future husband. We don't preach that in the church, though. We preach animalism in the church. Oh, that's all right. It's just sex. This girl, just repent. You're all right. Let's try not to do it again. We don't tell people how we, they've desecrated themselves and how they need to go through a process of consecration to get themselves, because they, they've infected their, their spirit. Know you not that he who lies with the harlot is one with her, for they too shall be one. That's not some cute little trite little saying about marriage. That's talking about the sexual act. That when two come together, when two bodies come together, it's not just physical. We're not just animals. But we're desecrating the holiness of God. And so that's the one with someone. When I, you, you, you say, Brother Hager, why are you on one? They just, listen, the reason I'm on one because I know how deep the stuff with the, our little sayings are. And I know how it's messed up a lot of y'all. 
So now some young lady who wants to live for God, remember the past, our, our, our basic parent, she, uh, the single woman and the single man are, are seeking how they, may pure, how they may please God, how they may please God. All of a sudden, they have to start changing their hows in order to have a relationship with some, some knucklehead dude. They have to change their hows of life. So in order for me, be, in order for me to find me a man, I got to be hoish. I got to start. Was that too brutal? I told you, we just stop. Listen, next week, when we talk about parenting, we'll be preaching again. But today, I just want to talk to y'all a little bit, talk to the single folks and, and the married folks who are jacked up a little bit. Because we all, come on, we all jacked up a little bit, ain't we? Amen. Let's, let's not get on the high horses. Me and everybody else, I've been married 32 years. Praise the Lord. And I'm still jacked up. So I know y'all have been you're married 32 hours, you know, glory to God. I know you jacked up. <laughs> Sit up here looking like <laughs> everything awesome. Praise God. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm, five, I'm seven minutes late. Let me, let me quit. The cycle is unbiblical and unhealthy. Here's the cycle. Baiting, dating, mating, fading, hating. That's the cycle. First you bait. You try to catch. Then you date. Then there's another relationship. Then you mate before you get married. Then, then all of a sudden it starts fading away. Right? Fading, right? And next thing you know, you're hating the person. Because it's a relationship that should have never existed. It's marriage that's a temporary marriage, which is a non sequitur in scripture. Okay. Think about this. When I was when I was coming up, I was an athlete. So athletes got letterman's jackets. Right? Letterman's jackets, you know. Had my big D on it for Dominguez. You know, my medals, you know. You know, I was first place in this, and you know, all my stuff on, you know, Letterman's jacket. Okay, now if you if you're dating somebody going steady, you let them wear your Letterman's jacket. Right? Until you see what I'm talking about? And now you got to give me my jacket back. I almost need that back. We need to have dissolution of property. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. In my in my class ring, baby, that's not an engagement ring, girl. That come back. Y'all following how this is? Because what happens is our dating teaches us how to be divorcers. It teaches us when times get rough or things ain't like we emotionally want them or things ain't, ain't right. We don't have to listen to God. We listen to our heart. And suddenly we live in ungodly. We try to fret like it's godliness. But it's ungodliness. I'm here to tell you that. Pull on it. I don't care. Anybody want to pull on it, just pull on it. I'm an old school COC. <laughs> old school. You could jump up on me and I just pow, hit you in the head with the scripture. Because it's ungodly. We're teaching ourselves ungodliness. I can't stay there. The next one, you will know in your heart if it's the right person. Jeremiah 17, 9 says the heart, the heart is deceitful. An unruly wickedness, who can know it? How, what you know in your heart is sin. I'm all by myself. Don't care today, though. Okay. Next one. There's, a, there's such a thing as, as non-consequential relationships. There is not. It's just a day. It's just a day. No, it's not. Humans connect spiritually, emotionally, physically. Especially women. Then the waiting game. Final one on the problem. The waiting game. Proverbs 18.22. Y'all love to quote this at me. I, I ain't, I ain't going to run after the man because the Bible says... Whosoever findeth a woman, findeth a good thing. So his job is to find me. Y'all need to, come on, come to, come to Hermeneutics class, or exegesis class, something, because that, that ain't what it's talking about, y'all. That ain't what it's talking about. You're in the waiting game. Glory to God. <laughs> Let me tell you something. You, <laughs> you want a godly man? You want a godly woman? A friend of mine said this. You got to go where the fish bite you. You're not going to catch fat catfish in your, in your tub. <laughs> Hallelujah. Well, I'm, I'm just, I'm just going to drop my, <laughs> I'm going to drop my line in this tub. It just, it's not happening. But let me tell you something. When you get to the pond, you got to go to the right pond. Right. Like, if you wanted a guy like me, you weren't going to find me in the club. Right. I'm just letting you know. I ain't saying with no good guys in the club. Obviously. 
I'm saying if you wanted me, no, he is a good guy. If you wanted me, you wasn't going to find me in the club. I'm just telling you. No. No. And I didn't want no woman that was hanging out in the club. You say, I got a problem. I know I got problems. I'm just letting you know how it was. You was hanging out in the club. What I want you for? What I want you for? What I want you for? You say, Brother Edgar, that just ain't right. Okay. All right. All right. I didn't say a person would go to the club every now and then. It's all right to go to jazz club, even go to the record club, go have fun. If you're living at the club, you getting drunk every night, what well, about you? I'm going to be fighting you about drinking because I don't drink at all. I mean, not even a sip. So, so how that going to work? Baby, we going out tonight? Sure. We going to the movies, to the non-alcoholic movies. <laughs> we going to the beach, to the non-alcoholic beach. We going to dinner, to the non-alcoholic dinner. You said, brother, hey, well, did, well, well, what if me and my what? Because I know a lot of you. Well, what if me and my wife like to go out and get a little, get a little? Then go. I ain't talking about you. Talk about me. Get out your feelings. <laughs> you don't want me, and I don't want you. We should be good. So if you want somebody godly, you got to go where godly folks are. And then you got, when you get there, you got to have godly bait. Finally, um, priority. Let's, we're just going to close here. I, I, I kept you guys too long, I know. Priority. The final thing he says is this. He says, listen, I don't say this to put a leash on you. But I say this to you, married and unmarried, he says, so that you can live in undivided devotion to God. What's your priority? I want to tell you a little story. I have two things up here today. I'm not going to deal with this one. Maybe I'll deal with that, that one next week. Any of y'all bowl? Anybody here bowl? Okay, you, you're like a non-bowler? You bowl. Ebonics, bowl. You bowl, okay, well, see, if, if, if you're like a, just a, a recreational bowler or just a drop-in bowler, you know, or if you're like an amateur bowler, when you get to, <laughs> you already know I'm going, don't you? When you get to, when you, if you're just like a rec, you're amateur, you, you just drop in, you get to the bowling alley, and you just go get a ball off the rack, right? And you just get the ball, and you know, you just, you just kind of, Put your fingers in all, just kind of testing them. See, <laughs> you know, you know, and and and, and they're just public balls. You know, just public balls. You know, anybody, any anybody, and everybody <laughs> could use some bowling balls. So, so what happens is you you just pick one, whichever one. It might be the it might be the right size or not, because you know you really don't care. You just there to have some fun. And so you, <laughs> so yeah, <laughs> so you go out and you get your ball and you you know um you know I mean you you do. And you don't care if it go in a gun or not. You're just having fun. You don't need no strikes or nothing, you know. You know, if you get a strike every now and then, woo! You know, the rest of that, you're just having fun. Right? You're just having fun. You, amen. 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 But, you know, if, if you're like a regular bowler, a serious bowler, you know, you got your own ball. You know, you, when you come there, you know, it, <laughs> this is my ball. And you don't just run up there and use my ball. No. This is my ball. If it's my fingers, it's my ball. When I was serious. You see what I'm saying? And if you look at it, I got some shoes in there too. Because I didn't want just to be putting my feet where everybody else had their feet either. So, so yeah, uh -huh. so, 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 uh, so I'm going out there, and, and not only do I do I want to, I got a bowl right. Um, if if you if you probably like Darren, he probably got a like a five step approach. But I don't bowl that regular, so I keep it simple. I got a four step approach, and so I push off one, two, three, pow! You was gonna catch it. <laughs> so, 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 so now, and I'm and I'm watching the ball, and I'm because I'm serious about this thing. 
I'm not just here, because when I leave, this Paul leave with me. Now, if you know, praise God, you want to be like the person, glory to God, you don't want to be just everybody bowling ball. The people just show up at the bowling alley and, and whoever wants to just come, come touch on you and, and praise God. And the folks that's in, in there picking, they don't care because some of the balls are cracked and been, been misused, open, they walk because they've been overused and they got issues so they can't even roll down, they roll down like this. Amen. You want to be the kind of Christian that people, glory to God, have to work to get you. They're serious about this. you got to be serious about this thing. it got to be special made. It's got to be drilled to fit my hand. And I'm telling you right now, if you will live godly, God will bring you the kind of person that fits you. And you won't have to be the person just settling over whoever's in the, in the rack. Amen. Come on, stand to your feet. We, we, we're 100 minutes late. Praise the Lord. Maybe you're here today and you're trying to date. Or you're here and you're a married person and, and you were feeling bad because you had, a, had a, some ungodliness in your dating. I want to present you the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the reason I'm presenting you the gospel is because that's the answer. You said, Brother Higgins, you know, a lot of those things you said, I, that's me. All the mistakes you're talking about, I made them. The reason I got married is because I got somebody pregnant. Just the wrong class for that. <laughs> the reason I got married is just I was desperate and lonely and I needed somebody to take care of me. Maybe that's you. Maybe that's you. Let me tell you about the love of God. All those perfect people that look at you and look at you sideways and judge you because you quote unquote got married the quote unquote wrong, wrong way. God's going to have worse sayings for them than for you. It's easy for God to deal with our sins because we all got them. I told you how jacked up I was. If you, if you push me, I'll even tell you I had a rating system. I had a little book with, with colors in it. I was trifling. I'm not proud of it. I was trifling. So we all got junk. We've all messed up and done things ungodly and treated people incorrectly. The question is not then. The question is now. Who are you today? Are you willing to be in submission to God today? Are you willing to turn and repent today? I'm not talking about yesterday. I'm talking about today. So, Brother Higgins, I'm dating somebody right now that they just ain't right for me. And I know they ain't right, and I know they ain't godly. Let me tell you what I, if, I, if it was me. Now you ain't got to do this. If it was me. And God's speaking to you right now, I wouldn't wait. I'd pick up my phone and I'd text him. I would. I'd say, you know what? This can't work. I'm not saying it can't never work, but today it can't work because I, I, I really can't. I really can't. I can't serve God and be with you. Now, maybe down the line, maybe once you get yourself together, I get myself together because we both jacked up, so we don't need to be with anybody. So, so I just, that's what I would do. Because that's how serious I was about being with God. Drawing close to God. That's how serious I was. Now, maybe you're not that serious. Maybe you like, you know, maybe you're still on that, oh, I'm going to fix him, I'm going to fix her. Can I, can, I help, can I help you a little bit? It ain't your job to fix people. That's God's job. And that's when you're so frustrated in a relationship because you're trying to fix people. But it ain't your job. When you get married, it's, still, it's not even your job to fix your husband or your wife. It's not your job. Your job is to seek how to please them. So you have a lifelong of, you know, and if, and, and I just, uh, can, I, can my male chauvinism come out a little bit? Because I just, I just find that women, dude, y'all change too much, dude. Change, man. I'm, I'm trying this one way. You know what I'm saying? It was working. Next day, it don't work at all. Maybe that's my maybe that's my male chauvinism. I, I, I admit my issues. But can I tell you something? Let's say let's say you're a guy and you have a woman and she just 
Let me tell you what your job is every day. That's your job, dude. That's your job. Say it. Men problem is a different one. I found. But more problem, the problem with men is they want doggone change. Oh my God. And the woman's doing her best, and she No. Nope. That passive aggressive kind of ridiculousness. Let me tell you what happened if you got a guy who's like that. Your job is still to learn how every day. If you're single, he says you got one job. He uses a very interesting term. He says, undivided devotion. Now, at first glance, I thought that word devotion, Devon, I thought that word was about spirituality. It's not. The word devotion is about focus. It's about having an undivided focus on God's purposes for your life. I thought it was about worship, you know. God wants you to be completely in a place of worship with him. And I preached that for years, you know. Single folks, you really need to get your consecration together. That's really not that what that word is. That word is about focus, attention. You give the Lord undivided attention on what he's trying to do. So all this other, so, so you got these 20 guys calling you. It's cool if you got 20 guys calling you. It's not, just not cool if you answer them 20 guys be, before you do what God asked you to do. Let the 20 guys call. Have 20 ladies calling you. Wonderful. But if you're not here, you probably need to just erase them and block them. Because now you're divided. You're, you're taken away from the covenant. You're distracted. And all distractions we need to get rid of. Because God has big plans for you. Amen, y'all? Again, I know I've been long, but praise the Lord. Hallelujah. If you need prayer, just come on right now. If you need to change, just come on right now. If, if you know God wants to do something for you, be brave this morning. And come on right now and let God change you. We're going to pray right now. Sister Rose Harris, um, she was just transported by the ambulance. Um, we're going to find out what. We're going to pray right now. God, our Father.